Hey, my name is Jeremy Block, and I must tell you that I am not a financial professional, and nor should you consider this financial advice. This video cast is for educational purposes only. I am merely sharing with you the things that I myself have learned to hopefully maybe better educate you and teach you something that you might not already know. Hey, hey, Blockhead Traders. Today is Sunday, March 7th, 2021, and this is the first episode of our weekly show that has yet to be named for Blockhead Traders. In this weekly show, we look to recap the previous week's trading action, look forward to the action in the upcoming week, and then tackle some topic about financial education. In this week's episode, we're going to tackle the covered call. At Blockhead Traders, we're trying to build a community of traders to help support each other as we grow in our trading experiences. As such, we've created a Discord channel. You can find the link down below in the description, which is open to everyone. One of my primary goals of starting this channel uh, is to really bring the lessons that I've learned uh, to the broader trading community. So maybe, just maybe, something that I've come across and I share with you uh, might be a data point that you get to learn from um, and grow your own knowledge. Uh, I don't actually expect anybody to really replicate exactly what I do. Uh, merely take in the data points that I can provide you. Uh, you can mix those with other resources that you've come across online, other discussions you've had with individuals, uh, and really develop your own trading style. Um, this show is really aimed at just sharing my experiences with you uh, in hopes that that might somehow better your experience as a trader, your learning, and your growth. Uh, I started trading uh, 2018, November. Well, I should say I traded much more before that, um, but I didn't really start trying to get into the options world and really understand um, all that there was with options, you know, how do you trade them? What do you do? Uh, how does this work? How does that work? And one of the things that I found in that journey um, was really um, a difficult time finding valuable, uh, good, honest resources. And that's really what Blockhead Traders aims to be. Blockhead Traders aims to be a resource that you can turn to, um, to maybe learn from, get some information from. We're not really a gimmick. We're not here to sell anything. We're not here to make any money off of this. Uh, this is really just me kind of sharing with the wider internet community the things that I've learned. Ironically, this past week was probably um, some of my worst performing or worst weeks for my portfolio that I've had uh, since I started really buckling down on the options and learning it and really building the current portfolio that I have. So this past week was really a volatile week in the market. Um, tech stocks really took the brunt of a lot of the pain this week, even though Friday did end up a pretty strong finish. Um, for the week overall, it definitely was not a strong, strong week. Um, started out real strong on Monday morning. Uh, throughout the day on Monday, I thought maybe we might have turned a corner uh, from the previous week. Uh, but there's all kinds of selling and declines that happened across the entire market throughout the week. Uh, most of it seems to be centered around inflation fears um, and that the economy is really coming back a lot faster than a lot of people had priced into the stocks. And I don't understand a lot of the macroeconomics super well to really explain them here on this show yet. It's something I myself am learning. Uh, largely the sell-offs that were happening uh, I feel are really due to rotations. So the past year, a lot of tech stocks have been doing really well. Um, a lot of that centering around the fact that those particular companies were really well versed to a remote work environment, um, remote uh, workforce. They can still sell their products. It wasn't like the services or travel industry that were pretty much shut off for the greater part of the last 12 months. Um, so they were still able to get profits. That's where the growth actually happened. Um, so a lot of investors were really piling in those stocks and causing them to kind of drive up over the past 12 months. So a lot of the volatility this week in the market uh, had to do with inflation fears, uh, the fact that the economy was potentially rebounding much stronger than a lot of uh, traders had been anticipating and kind of priced into a lot of the stocks. 
I really think what we're starting to see here is a rotation out of the growth tech stocks, which have really been performing extremely well over the past 12 months in the COVID environment. Um, and you're starting to see that the growth is slowing in those. Um, they've grown so far, so fast. And a lot of the other parts of the economy, the financials, uh, the travel industry, um, consumer discretionary, um, and other service-based companies are starting to pick back up again now that the vaccine is really kind of getting out there more and more. Um, states, cities are starting to open up and lift restrictions from the COVID. And so I think what you're starting to see is investors taking their profit from those, call them lockdown stocks, uh, and shifting that money into the higher growth potential, which would be your travel industry, your service industry, um, and that's really where a lot of those stocks will reba rebound. If you look at some of the charts for some of those discretionary stocks, you can see that they've never really fully recovered uh, in the same way that a lot of the tech stocks really have done. So uh, this week was really all about a lot of that rotation, I think. Um, there's also a lot of inflation fears uh, that really caused a lot of sell-off, and it really kind of came to a head on Friday uh, with the uh, jobs numbers that was re that were released. Um, the market really sold off after that and kind of started to hit a bottom around uh, lunchtime on Friday and really rebounded super strong uh, for the balance of the trading day. And let me just pull up here for you and share with you um, some of the chart that I've kind of been looking at, which is the S&P uh, and the NASDAQ chart. So let's take a look here at this chart. Um, you can see up here we have the uh, SPY. Uh, down here is the NASDAQ index. Uh, you can see that the NASDAQ has really been under a lot of pressure here uh, since about mid-February. Um, it sold off a good bit. Started to level back. You can see these, these are uh, one-day bars, and you can see the, the wide uh, range in these trading bars that have really picked up in the past couple of trading sessions. Um, and the S&P is the other one up here on the top. Uh, it too, the, vol the volatility in the markets have just really skyrocketed since um, mid-February, uh, which is great for premium selling, uh, which we'll kind of get into in a little bit here. Um, but really, I, I, what I'm really kind of looking for as we head into next week is I'm really kind of hoping we're starting to hit a short-term bottom here. Um, I don't really think that the markets overall bullish trend is really quite ready to back off and, and head in a bearish territory. I really think we have a good bit of uh, bull market to go or at least uh, sideways. Uh, maybe not quite the, the, you can see the uptrend that we've had since. So here is where um, last March and the big COVID crash uh, and this real steady uh, gro growth out of there. And you can see we periodically kind of pull back to these moving averages and kind of bounce back up. We pull back to the moving average. We've done that a few times. Um, and what I'm really kind of looking for is I'm, I'm kind of looking for um, this to be kind of a touch point and a little bit more stabilization as we head, head forward into next week. Um, so I'm really hoping that um, around Friday at, at noon was kind of the bottom or at least the short term bottom of this, uh, bear sell-off and that we're going to start rebounding and, and heading back up the other way. So I don't have a lot of trades that I'm looking at next week. Um, a lot of my portfolio is really kind of tied up and, and maxed out right now as far as what I'm comfortable allocating out into the market of my capital. Um, so I'm just kind of in a holding pattern, um, letting my trades work out, uh, letting some of that theta roll in. Hopefully the, the underlyings pick up in price. Um, and I'll be able to start closing some some winners out potentially right now. Portfolio is not looking too good. Um, not really going to go through the portfolio much this week. Um, this is just kind of an initial episode here. Um, we'll talk more about my portfolio in upcoming episodes, upcoming weeks. Um, we have so much to cover um, that I want to get across and, and kind of share with you. But I want to try to keep a lot of these episodes um, in a shorter time frame. I don't really like watching those YouTube channels that go on for an hour and a half, two hours. Um, so I'm really shooting to keep this video around, you know, 15 to 30 minutes in length. So in this week's episode, I really wanted to touch on the covered call. Um, 
The covered call is actually not a trade that I myself enter very often. I, I happen to have um, two of them on right now, actually. Um, but what I have found is when I speak with a lot of other people that are really getting into options trading, um, they want to learn a little bit more about option selling, or maybe they don't even know about options. Uh, and the thing that seems to catch their interest and bring them in um, to learn more, uh, I've seen a lot of the covered call be that, that tool that brings them in. So there, there's kind of two types of investors that I've, I've come across um, traditional investors that are out there, you know, buying shares of companies that they think are going to go up over time and just constantly building that position um, over, t you know, more position, more position. Every time it pulls back, they add some more shares, um, really looking for those companies to kind of go on the upswing. The other type of investor that I've come across is a call buyer. So these people are usually looking for big moves in stocks. Um, so they're buying calls, out of the money calls, usually pretty far out of the money calls, um, far out in time. And their hope is that the underlying stock really starts pushing towards those um, call strike prices. So the one neat thing that I think pairs really well with a, I'm gonna say it's a buy and hold investor. Uh, this is the type of person that's buying positions of a particular company that they like. Uh, over time is they're accumulating more and more and more positions and and I'm a big fan of option selling a lot of what I'm going to talk on this channel is going to center around option selling it's what I do it's what I understand um, it's the type of thing that I'm real comfortable sharing with you guys the viewer um, and really I think certain things kind of can complement particular trading styles or give you a little extra boost um, or a little extra kind of money in your pocket if you would and covered call is is one of those interesting things that i really think a buy and hold investor uh, might be interested in and a lot of them actually don't even know that this is a thing and so i really want to talk about a covered call here but essentially a call when you sell a call you are promising that you can fulfill and deliver shares of an underlying uh, at a certain price and why this fits in with the buy and hold investor um, because a call contract represents a hundred shares so if you happen to have a hundred shares of, of any company uh, one of the things that you can do is you can sell a covered call and what that actually is is you're selling a call uh, on the market which basically says you, you're selling a coupon to someone else in the market that says, I will sell you 100 shares of company, you know, General Motors. Let's say you have, let's say you have 100 shares of General Motors. Um, you can sell a coupon out there to somebody to say, I will sell you 100 shares of General Motor at $75. If, if the price breaches $75, um, I'm willing to sell my shares for $75. Now, maybe your cost basis is like, $70. Um, and when you sell that coupon, that person that is buying it is going to pay you a premium to have that coupon so that they can have the right to get 100 shares of General Motors for you for $75. And that premium can vary. And we'll take a look here. I'm going to pull up some examples. Um, and we'll kind of just walk through, I guess, General Motors is a fine one to look at. Um, but it doesn't cost you anything to sell that to that person because you already have the 100 shares of General Motors. And you're gonna get money by simply selling that coupon. And you get to keep that money. You don't ever have to give that money back. So whether or not they buy those shares of General Motors from you at $75 a piece, or whether that option expires worthless, you get to keep that money that they paid for that coupon. So. Let me pull up uh, an option chain on General Motors and let me just kind of walk you through this and let's talk through it. Okay, so I use um, Thinkorswim is my platform that I use. Um, this is a platform by TD Ameritrade. Um, every brokerage platform uh, pretty much has this type of thing. So the interface that you're seeing here is Thinkorswim by TD. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to look up uh, General Motors. 
So General Motors is currently trading for about 53.75. So let's say you are a long-term investor that has been building up shares of General Motors. So what I'm going to do is um, this screen that I'm on is is a profit and loss simulator or calculator. Um, it also kind of shows you the option chains. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that you have a thousand shares of General Motors. Well, that's kind of a lot. Let's just say you have 200 shares of General Motors and I'm going to set this price. Um, let's say you've been accumulating these. So maybe your cost basis uh, is around $45. So uh, if we look on here, you can kind of see what your profit and loss is. So if, you're, if your cost basis for your 200 shares, um, right here where it crosses the middle line, this is your break even, that's gonna be your cost basis because anytime the stock is above $45, you're making money. Anytime it's below $45, you're not making money. Um, of course, none of those gains are really realized until you actually sell or get rid of your 200 shares. But um, let's go ahead and throw a covered call on here to see what that actually looks like. So uh, when you go to look at your option chains um, in premium selling, and we'll touch on this on future videos and stuff, uh, but really where you're really looking is you're looking to sell uh, an option usually 30 to 45 days to expiration um, is really the spot that you do best when you sell them. And the reason for that is, is theta decay. And theta decay uh, is not a linear decay, and, and we're going to touch on this in a future episode, so don't worry too much about what it is exactly. Um, just know that it really starts to accelerate around the 30-day mark, um, and the faster that theta decays for an option seller, that's better. Um, that means the option price is going to come down faster after that time, um, and as an option seller, the more that that option declines in value, the more you make as an option investor or an option seller. So I'm gonna go ahead and look, I tend to always trade in the monthlies. So GM also happens to have weeklies. You can see here, um, weeklies are just options that expire at the end of a particular week. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna look at the April 16th, which is a monthly, so the monthly is basically just don't have the weekly designation. And we have our calls on the left side and our puts on the right side. And when you're doing a covered call, it really kind of comes down to, you know, what price are you willing to sell it at? Because there does exist the possibility that, that these shares will be called away from you upon an exercise. Um, and in that case, you'll, you'll keep the premium that we're gonna put on here and you'll get the proceeds from the 100 shares or however many shares you're selling at a, that particular strike price. Um, a lot of times I tend to look at about a 30 delta contract when I'm selling any sort of option, uh, not necessarily just for a covered call, uh, but even for um, my normal premium selling that I'll, I'll kind of engage on. So right here, that's going to probably be about the $60 strike price. Um, you can see the 55 is about a 48 delta. Um, the 60 is a 28 delta. So all we're going to do is we're going to add a sale in here of the 60. And what this means, we'll go back to the profit and loss calculator here. And each one contract is good for 100 shares. Um, so with 200 shares of General Motors, you actually um, can go ahead and sell two contracts uh, because that would be the equivalent of 200 shares. And let's take a look here at what this does to this chart. Okay. So what selling two call contracts of General Motors at a $60 strike price. What this actually means is that whoever buys those contracts has the right to exercise them before April 16th. And if they choose to do that, uh, you, the option seller, will be obligated 
to sell them 200 shares of General Motors at $60 a share. Uh, so in this case, if you sold two contracts um, and if the price was over $60, you are at risk for exercise, which is not a bad thing. It basically means you're going to be selling your shares at $60 uh, upon expiration. And you notice that your break even here is kind of shifted down a little bit. Okay, so I actually, to, to make this a little bit easier to see, um, I shifted the cost basis here of your uh, 200 shares of General Motors to say that your cost basis for that was maybe $51. Um, and the reason I did that is to show you that if you chose not to sell this this covered call basically your, your break even is this you know fifty one dollars so anytime that the stock is above fifty one dollars you know you're making money if it's below not so much now if you sell two contract two call contracts you basically are going to collect um a dollar forty three a share so because this represents 200 shares, um, this is roughly $286 that you're going to collect. So when you sell these two contracts, your account is going to go up by $286. And what will happen then is you've kind of capped your max gain for General Motors. So if General Motors ever gets to $60, you're never going to make more than um, right here, $2,086. So if you didn't actually sell the call, you can see that your your upside is really that there's no limit because you just own the outright shares. However, if we kind of look into the probability of, you know, where might General Motors be uh, prior to the end of April or the end of the contract, so April 17th, um, this gray area is basically the one standard deviation move that is expected within General Motors. So you can see that, um, actually let me just add a price slice here. And what this will do is I can set this price slice at $60. Sorry, that is not the right one set it here at $60. Um, so what you can see is that there's really only a 24% chance um, today that General Motors is actually going to be above $60 before uh, April 16th. So what that means is if General Motors doesn't get above $60, you get to keep that $286 free, free and clear. Um, and this type of strategy is something that goes really well with buy and hold, in my opinion, uh, because what you can do is kind of just sell your calls out of the money, you know, somewhere where you're happy to sell for, um, pocket that premium, and as you get closer to expiration, uh, either let it expire worthless, or what I would do is I would actually close it out early um, so you'd basically have to buy that option back, but you wait until that option price kind of comes down in value, uh, before you buy it back. Let me, let me just show you that here, um, on the chart. So I'm going to hide the, the stock on this chart. So this is, if you just have the, the call, um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here just to give you a, so the purple line is what your option is worth today. Um, and in this case, well, March 8th, so tomorrow. And the blue line is what it's worth at expiration. And so what you'll see is, um, and when I say worth, it's basically profit for you, the seller. So as time moves forward, that option price actually declines, which is a profit for you, the seller, because you can buy it back at a lower cost than you sold it for. So, for example, if you know, as I keep ticking these days, you can see that purple line gets taller and taller and taller. Now, the gray line is kind of coming in and coming in because the uh, likelihood of closing out by this by this date now 
March 26. It's basically on March 26, the expected uh, range or expected standard deviation is, is kind of shrinking and closing in as you get closer to the expiration of the option. But you can see that, that maybe on end of March, March 30th, uh, you can close that option, means buy it back, and the, the purple value, so over here, this is the purple value, um, wherever the cursor is. So you can see that you know if, if GM was still around $53, uh, on March 30th, you would, would be able to most likely close that option out and keep $181 uh, in profit. So really what you can do uh, is close this thing out early. So maybe around March 30th, you end up closing your call out, buying the call back. Uh, so you don't get to keep all of your $286 in that case because you're going to have to spend some money to buy the contract back. Now the contract's going to be a lot cheaper. So you get to keep the difference between the two. Um, so in this particular case, at that price, uh, you'd get to keep about $180, and then you just sell another call. And you just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Um, so you can take it all the way to expiration to see you know, if you end up getting called away at 60, which would still give you, um, you get the $286 in your pocket, plus at $60 a share, you're making another $9 a share here because your cost basis is at 51. So the only real drawback to selling a covered call is if you happen to be in a stock that just shoots to the moon. Um, so let me, you know, if, if, if GM went from where it is today at $53, let's say it went up to $78, okay, you're still going to only make the profit as if you sold it for $60. So that that's the drawback is um, you could potentially be leaving money on the table. Um, but if you really look at the probability and everything, you know, the odds are in your favor that this thing really isn't going to go above 60 and if it does it's probably not going above that far above 60 and and even if it did you're still selling for a profit so it, it's hard to get mad um, on anybody that got a that makes a profit the one thing i would caution you with covered call um, is don't sell a call that is less than your break even on the underlying stock and what I mean by that is let's say for example your your General Motors um, you know let's say your cost basis was actually 65 okay I, I know it can't be 65 because it's never traded there but let's let's say your cost basis was 65 and you sold a $60 call because that's where the premium was um, you can see that you would run the risk if it went above $60 that you're actually going to lose money. And, and the reason you're going to lose money is because your cost basis is above where you're selling the, the strike price of your covered call at. Um, you can do this, but I, I strongly advise against it. Um, so sometimes you're going to get into a position where the underlying drops so far that in order to sell a covered call where the premium makes sense, it's not actually going to be above your break even. Um, so my recommendation in that situation is just not to sell the covered call. Um, let me, let me show you and, and my portfolio, I actually have this situation right now. Um, so let me clear this P and L here. Okay. So I'm going to take you to my portfolio. Uh, because I actually have a particular position in SNDL that is a covered call, and I'm actually selling a call that is under my break-even price. But let me let me show you that um, here. So I got into SNDL um, back when it was a meme stock, 
Um, well, it still is a meme stock, but it was one of the Wall Street bets thing. And I decided I'd take a little bit of money to just kind of mess around and goof around with it um, to see what would happen. So if you take a look at the chart, I basically got into this trade um, after this, this big day of just monster high here. Probably got into it at a terrible, terrible time. Um, but at this point, I said, you know, at the worst case, I think the volatility in this was several hundred uh, percent. I, I don't even, I don't know if it was quite in the thousands, but it was like 600% volatility or something just ginormously crazy. And so what I decided to do was scale into it, buying 100 shares at a time. And then once I accumulated those shares, I was going to use the volatility to sell a call. And the reason I wanted to do that um, was because the call premium was super high. However, judging by what happened to GameStop, um, Bed Bath & Beyond, AMC, there was a very high likelihood of just getting beat up if I sold the call naked. Um, so one thing that I don't really do at all anymore is sell naked calls on equities. I will sell naked calls. We can get into this in a future episode. I will sell naked calls on indexes, but on equities, I just don't do it anymore. Um, I've got burned a lot of times. And so if I had sold the call naked, I would have run into a situation where potentially I could be out a lot of money if SNDL would skyrocket. So what I did was I decided to buy into SNDL with just raw shares because the share price was so low. It was easy for me to accumulate 100 shares and stay within um, my position sizing limits. And then once I had accumulated the shares, I would go ahead and sell a call against it, which would basically be covered by the shares that I had. Um, so that was very important for me to do that. So my cost basis ended up being about um, $3.34. Uh, let me switch back here so you can see that. So my cost basis was $3.34 is what it ended up being uh, after I had scaled in. I think I purchased 10 lots of 100 shares uh, throughout the opening of that trading day. And now my current call that I have out there sold is at a $2 strike. Now, my cost basis really isn't $3.34 because before I sold this March 12th call, I had previously sold another call. Um, so if I jump over to my trading journal, which I keep on all my positions, um, you can see that the very first call that I traded, um, that I sold a call, uh, call in was actually a February 26th expiration. And I sold that for uh, 95 cents. I sold 10 of them. So I basically brought in um, $950 from that. So I actually lowered my cost basis uh, 95 cents from the um, 334. You know, that lowered my cost basis down to $2.40. When I closed that call, I went out and I sold another one at the $2 strike because by that time the underlying had really fallen down um, as far as down the, down the uh, price. So I sold the next one. I sold 10 of those at uh, 39 cents. So I basically picked up another $390 or 39 cents. So my new break even is pretty much right at $2. So you can see here that these calls expire on March 12th. And if I look at the probability, you know, being above $2 is well outside that one standard deviation. So now my cost basis on these thousand shares of SNDL is now $2. So now this, when this coming week comes and this option expires, presumably worthless on March 12th, um, my break even is actually up here at 210. Uh, but if I if I come into the option chain for say April and I want to look down at the strikes above 210, you know, I'm really only looking at, you know, 250 here. I could sell a 250 um, 
we can do 10 of these. And you can see that I then would push down my break even, even a little bit further to $2 because I'd knock another 10 cents off. Um, for me, I probably won't do this because this is one of those situations where the amount that I'm bringing in from this, this option, the premium is not really there that, that well, um, not high enough for me. So what I'm probably going to end up doing is holding on to these thousand shares. And then if the shares push up in price, um, so let's say they make it up to say a dollar 80 at a dollar 80, I now might go in and look at the option chain um, at about a $2 strike or maybe even a 250 strike because I'm really only going to be, you know, 50 cents to 80 cents out of the money. And if you look at the, you know, the things that are about 50 cents out of the money, the premium is a lot higher uh, and I would be above my break even. Um, so that that's really the trade that I would kind of be looking at. So. So that is the covered call. And I'm sure we're going to touch on that in many future episodes. Uh, in fact, in a future episode, um, I'm planning to have a co-host for this weekly show. And one of the things that I found is different types of option strategies really catch the attention of new option traders. And I found quite a few option traders getting caught with the uh, covered call as something that really piques their their curiosity and really asks them to or really gets them to dig into what the covered call is and how it might um, go with their trading style. So hopefully my future co-host uh, could share some of the thoughts that they have on the covered call and the things that they found interesting and how that kind of brought them into the world of option selling. So that about wraps it up for this week's episode. Uh, look forward to next week's episode and this is the first time i've ever really kind of recorded so i'm sure it's going to be it's kind of a little rough um we'll get better at it so leave some comments below uh join the discord uh drop a note say hi um mention different topics that you might want to hear talk about or learn about or things you don't quite understand um be more than happy if it's something i'm comfortable with to you know talk about them on the weekly show uh, if not, I'll look into trying to figure out more about it. Um, really, I'm all about sharing my experiences. So if it if it happens to be something that I have experience in, I'm more than happy to uh, share it with you guys. So uh, thanks for joining me in the first show, and hopefully the format will improve and things will just get better. So drop in the Discord and drop me a comment. Have a great week. Good luck, everybody. And remember, think outside the block.